Dr. Jack Bright is one of the Foundation's most enigmatic and chaotic figures, infamous for being the subject of a humorous joke file passed between personnel titled, The Things Dr. Bright is Not Allowed to Do at the Foundation, which describes, well, exactly that. By reading the list, you'd get an idea that this Dr. Bright fellow is a pretty fun and goofy guy, certainly popular enough to get an entire list that he has himself as the sole punchline. But while that much is true, it's not the whole story. Sure, he's a strange man with an even stranger sense of humor, but a lot of that apparent weirdness comes from Jack Bright's experiences throughout his life. Or lives, we should say. We'll explain. Needless to say, he has quite the story to tell. For starters, Dr. Jack Bright is immortal. Not in the sense that he cannot die, but that his soul itself is permanently affixed to an amulet, which has been given the designation SCP-963-1. Originally, the amulet was in possession of the Foundation as a minor anomalous object that was incapable of being damaged. While Dr. Bright was transporting the amulet, the deadly warrior SCP-076-2, nicknamed Abel, broke free from its resting coffin and went on a murderous rampage throughout the facility. Dr. Bright, who was holding SCP-963-1, was one of the first killed in action. Days later, after the chaos had subsided, a Foundation rescue team recovered Bright's body from the wreckage, with SCP-963-1 along with it. When the D-Class operative who stumbled upon the amulet put it on, he gained the memories, personality, and consciousness of Jack Bright. The mind of the D-Class was wiped entirely, and only Bright remained. When the amulet was removed, the D-Class went into a vegetative state, ceasing all brain activity. Thanks to SCP-963-1, Dr. Bright is immortal. His consciousness is stored in the amulet itself and transfers to whoever puts it on. After a 30-day period of wearing the amulet, the new body's brain will become a duplicate of the late Dr. Bright's, even when the amulet is removed from their person. This could effectively allow a whole number of Dr. Bright's to run wildly around the Foundation if left unchecked. Thankfully, the Foundation has many safety measures in place to prevent exactly that from happening, such as limiting the current Bright host body to one person and keeping an eye on which body Bright is presently occupying. Unfortunately, this hasn't always worked as you'll see in today's SCP briefing, SCP-4498, the plurality of Jack Bright. Being immortal has a few downsides. For one, Bright feels tied to the amulet, unable to be released. He's occupied countless bodies and longs for a way out. Deep down, he's aware that he may never truly die, doomed to a fate of eternal body switching until the universe burns out. Maybe that's where Bright's goofiness comes from, he plays the act of a clown to hide the pain and tragedy of his life. Regardless of how Bright may act, no one can deny that his story isn't tragic. But this particular event was a little less than tragic. In fact, it was a Bright overload. The exact kind of scenario the Foundation wanted to prevent through their containment procedures of SCP-963 and the tracking of which body Bright was currently occupying. In fact, that's what SCP-4498 is. It's the designation given to a group of over 325 men, women, animals, and anomalous entities who were previously assigned to Foundation Facility Site-53, who now assume the consciousness of Dr. Jack Bright. But how did this happen? More importantly, how does the Foundation keep such a wild array of characters contained? Well, since SCP-4498 makes up the entire personnel of a former site, the Foundation was able to establish a quarantined exclusion zone, where Site-53 used to be. Interaction with the Bright instances was limited to only necessary communications, and separation of an SCP-4498 instance from the quarantined exclusion zone was not permitted. In case any of the instances acted out of line, as Dr. Bright tends to do from time to time, an applied task force named Bright-99, oh no you don't, was created to subdue any rowdy brights and keep them where they belong, through the use of non-lethal means. Until the Foundation is able to find a way to neutralize the effects of SCP-4498, the former personnel of Site-53 are stuck in containment, harboring the consciousness of Jack Bright. But again, how did this even happen? On May 9, 2018, an unexpected interaction between a now-neutralized anomaly and SCP-963-1 at Site-53 resulted in the creation of this quirky anomaly. 
Bright had been assigned to the facility because of his expertise regarding a certain anomaly they were studying, a small porcelain cat statue that appeared to negate or depress the effects of nearby anomalies when its tail was turned clockwise. But on that day when Dr. Bright arrived at work, he mishandled the object. Instead of turning the tail clockwise, he turned it counterclockwise by accident. This resulted in the tail breaking off of the statue and triggering a new, never-before-seen anomalous effect that amplified and engulfed the entire site once it interacted with SCP-963-1, the amulet hanging from Bright's neck. Upon breaking the tail, the lights at Site-53 flickered and all personnel collapsed to the floor and the security cameras lost power. When the security cameras rebooted, all personnel were standing straight up. There was immediate confusion, especially among the research team who was observing Bright's inspection of the anomaly. They weren't sure what happened. One researcher suggested that they had all swapped bodies. Another was confused as to why he was in his current body. On the count of three, the researchers decided to shout out their names, just to see who ended up in whose body. On three, they all yelled the same name, Jack Bright. The implications of what happened were just beginning to sink in. Dr. Bright then called his longtime friend Dr. Sophia Light, site director of the famous Site 17. The phone call between Light and Bright was panicked, as Jack described the emergency to his friend and attempted to find a solution. Okay, we were working on that dumb little cat thing that we were going to use in the anchor trials, right? Maybe two hours ago? I, I, I don't know. I was looking at it and then I went to turn the tail. Dr. Light immediately knew what Bright was talking about. Clockwise, right? Yes, clockwise. Uh, when I turned it um, clockwise, it, it broke in my hand, just like that, poof. Dr. Light could sense that something had gone majorly wrong, just from the way Bright emphasized the word poof. For a few moments, Bright danced around the implication that he was responsible for breaking the cat, hoping instead to use a less incriminating euphemism. Light finally got him to spit it out. They're all me! Every single one of them, Sophia! I know I'm me, obviously, I'm wearing the amulet, but… Dr. Bright was cut off. Seconds later, he returned to the phone, clearly relieved that he wasn't seen by any of the Bright clones that were now patrolling Site-53. They're out here, storming around, throwing stuff, writing naughty words on the whiteboards. They're mad. Every single one of them. The site is in lockdown. I'm sitting here in the bathroom trying to stay out of sight, and I need an evac, Sophia! Dr. Light was unamused and asked why these wacky events always seemed to happen while she was busy. Bright begged and pleaded, asking her to send a task force or to check and see what Dr. Mann could do. Light shot down Bright's request, saying that Mann was at a conference off-site. When Bright asked where, Light informed him that it was at Site 53 and that he had just gotten there a few minutes ago. Bright paused, shuddered, and struggled to stay calm as he informed Light that he was at Site-53 too. This was the site where the SCP-4498 anomaly had taken effect. The security cameras showed utter chaos across Site-53. The team Dr. Mann brought alongside him to the conference was composed of the Foundation's All-Stars. Famous names like Dr. Gears, Agent Troy Lament, Dr. Kane Pathos Crow, and even the infamous Dr. Clef. These Foundation superstars were on the run, being pursued by a mob of angry Jack Bright SCP-4498 instances, who wielded broken furniture, tires, and kitchen utensils in their pursuit of the conference-goers. Site-53 was put on lockdown, and after several hours of radio silence, Global Task Force Rea-7 gate guns arrived to infiltrate the site and de-escalate the situation. When the task force operatives arrived, they immediately began to search for Dr. Bright. Unsurprisingly, when they called out to him, several voices responded. When the task force lead introduced himself and informed the instances that they were sent to extract Dr. Bright, an SCP-4498 instance that took over the body of Site-53 personnel Dr. Herman Donaldson brandished a rifle and informed the operatives that they were all Jack Bright. He told the task force to leave and that the situation was under control. As he was saying this, an explosion was heard behind him, which the instant seemed completely unfazed by. When the lead reiterated that they were just there to extract Dr. Mann, his team, and the real Jack Bright, the instances got upset at the implication that they were anything less than the genuine article. It was certain. SCP-4498 had taken over Site-53, and they were the ones calling the shots. The Foundation's quiet and kind Dr. Kiru then stood up, now affected by SCP-4498, 
and wearing a flashy jacket and hat. She introduced herself as the Pirate Queen Jack Bright and spoke in a heavy pirate accent. When the task force attempted to breach the site further, Dr. Kiru and her devoted crewmates fired upon them, though since they were all Jack Brights, they were actually horrible shots. In fact, the task force never really felt like they were in danger, despite being fired on by several dozen SCP-4498 instances. Instead, they hid themselves and waited for backup. But the personnel were the only ones affected by SCP-4498. Site-53 was also host to a number of sentient humanoid anomalies who were now harboring the consciousness of Jack Bright. In fact, in an incredible stroke of bad luck, Site-53 happened to be containing one of the most famous murder monsters the Foundation has ever faced. That's right, SCP-096, the Shy Guy. The Shy Guy had been relocated from its original containment to Site-53, and it now possessed the mind of Dr. Bright. Security footage showed an SCP-4498 instance being lured to SCP-096's containment chamber. SCP-096, now possessing the voice of Bright, pretended to be a Bright instance locked inside the containment chamber and asking the onlooking instance to free it. The instance suspected it was a trap, but the Bright on the other side assured him that he was doing important, um, science things, and that this was certainly, absolutely not a trap. Convinced by SCP-096's amazing acting, the SCP-4498 instance opened the chamber door and let loose the SCP-4498-SCP-096 hybrid, which threw the other bright instance down the length of the entire hallway. SCP-096 was elated to run around the site and wreak havoc, just as the others were doing. Another bright emerged from Site-53's trash receptacles, covered in waste and sewage. He spoke to a group of rats, encouraging them to join him in the sewers below. The rat brights praised their new leader and followed him into the dumpster. Back up front, the brights led by Pirate Queen Kiru had constructed a wooden pirate ship over a Foundation issue M1 Abrams tank. Bound and tied to the mast was Agent Troy Lament. Meanwhile, as the brights ran rampant through Site-53, Dr. Mann and his conference team were cooped up in a storage closet hiding from the chaotic mob actively looking for them. Needless to say, they weren't very happy. After a roll call check, Dr. Man smelled something foul and informed the scientist-turned-golden retriever Kane Pathos Crow to remove his dog butt from his face. Dr. Crow then informed Man that he was across the closet and that the behind belonged to someone else. In that moment, the real Dr. Jack Bright, stinking butt and all, introduced himself causing all of the closet crew to jump back in shock. Bright tried to reason with Man's crew and beg them to let him hide, but the crew started debating whether or not they should just throw Bright to the pirate crew for causing all of this ridiculous trouble in the first place. Then Dr. Crow, in his infinite doggy wisdom, came up with a solution. They could find the cat statue, repair it, and get Dr. Bright to utilize SCP-963 on the cat statue effectively freeing the Site-53 inhabitants from Bright's consciousness. Bright liked the idea well, until he realized that it might break the amulet in the process, and with that, the crew set off. Meanwhile, the pirate crew was posting flyers around the site that read, To the coward Jack Bright, by the high authority of Her Saltiest Majesty Jack Bright, Pirate Queen, Raider of the High Seas, Mad Butterfly of the Rolling Waves, we do command you to appear before the Pirate Council to negotiate the release or butt stabbing and then execution of one Troy Lament. His crimes are numerous, lollygagging, saying hurtful things, criticizing Queen Bright's very good hat. This won't be forgiven. Appear or be butt stabbed. Dr. Man's crew had no choice. They appeared before the group of bright instances that called themselves the High Council and began to negotiate for control of Site-53. Dr. Man, Gears, Bright, and Crow spoke with Pirate Queen Kiru and a few other bright instances, who all introduced themselves in equally ridiculous ways. One was representing the culinary jacks of the kitchens and break rooms, whose feasts were legendary and apparently very tasty. Another was representing the sneaky darkness jacks of the parts of the site where the power had gone out. They are sneaky and very mysterious as the representative pointed out. 
Another was Master Jack, Lord of the Aqua Jacks, protector of the toilets and sinks. Then you have the Master of the Rats, Filth Jack, who asked the Council to behold as many armies of trash and refuse. And with that, the almighty Council of Jack Brights had established themselves. The two groups began negotiations to rescue Agent Troy Lament, who, as Kiru pointed out earlier, was about to be subjected to a fierce butt-stabbing. As Agent Lament was brought up into the court, Pirate Queen Bright laid out her terms. SCP-963-1, the amulet that contained Bright's consciousness. Bright was confused and asked why, to which Kiru replied that it was because they weren't sure just how long the SCP-4498 Brights were going to last. They didn't want to suddenly die off, and with the amulet they could guarantee their status as bodies of Dr. Bright forever. Bright refused and tried to appeal to reason, stating that since they were all him, he knew that deep down they were all sensible people, known for their good instincts and controlled temperaments. This statement earned Bright some raised eyebrows from Man's crew, who knew of the doctor's ridiculous exploits all too well. Kiru once again asked for the amulet. Bright agreed, but only if they gave them the cat statue. The Council of Brights reluctantly agreed, and the exchange was made. The statue was tossed to Man's crew, who in response pushed Dr. Bright into the crowd of SCP-4498 instances, who promptly restrained the doctor. While Gears and the crew attempted to fix the cat statue, Dr. Kiru Pirate Queen Bright had other plans for the captured Dr. Bright. Brandishing a comically large knife, she told Bright that he was about to lose something very important to his dignity and manhood. Bright panicked and started to plead with Kiru. Just in time, Gears tossed the cat statue to Bright, who turned the tail back clockwise. The SCP-4498 instances jumped back, fell forward again, and rubbed their heads. And for a brief moment, they were back to normal. Dr. Kiru questioned her flashy pirate outfit, but because things can never work out for Jack Bright, it was only Dr. Kiru and Clef who regained their original senses. The rest of the SCP-4498 instances were too far out of range for the cat statue to work, and to make matters worse, the statue disintegrated seconds later. Now, with a restored Clef and Kiru and a rescued Agent Lament, Dr. Bright and the rest of Man's team ran out of Site-53, being chased by a horde of angry SCP-4498 instances once more. Following their escape, Site-53 was recontained and the current containment procedures were established. Dr. Bright and the personnel who escaped that day were subjected to a series of interviews. Dr. Mann, being the renowned greatest surgeon in the Foundation, gave a bombastic account of the day's events, where he downplayed the importance and the help the members of his conference team gave him during their escape. Another member of the conference team, Dr. Desi, was particularly upset at the apparent inefficiency of the Mobile Task Force squad sent to reclaim Site-53. Wondering why one of the hundreds of more competent task forces couldn't have been sent instead to save them all from the horror of having to listen to Jack Bright talk to himself for over 12 hours. Dr. Sophia Light informed Dr. Bright, after an awkward reunion between the two, that he was going back on special probation as a punishment for his actions. A task involving something with a wombat, the exact details of which are vague and nebulous. Whatever the case, Dr. Bright was certainly displeased by this. Agent Lament was still recovering from his capture by the pirate Brights, and from his shell-shocked state, it seemed like it was going to take him a while to get over it. Dr. Clef, during his interview, admitted that he was late to the site, and was only pretending to be a Bright instance because he thought it'd be entertaining. After laughing to himself about beating the captured Troy's body with a trout, Clef concluded his interview with a single statement, I love the SCP Foundation. Now go watch SCP Immortal Dr. Bright Explained and Dr. Bright for President SCP-4444 Bush vs. Gore for more on the anomalously quirky Dr. Jack Bright.